Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in God's holy place? The person who has clean hands and a pure heart and does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. That one will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of our salvation. That's from Psalm 24. Be with me in prayer. So let it be our God. May we come before you with clean hands and a pure heart. May we receive your blessing of salvation. May we live in your mercy and grace. Amen. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Such is the tenor of David in Psalm 99 and the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. The world belongs to God and everything and everyone on the face of the earth. God created it and established it. From the residents of Western Massachusetts to the Maasai of the Serengeti, from the polar bears in the Arctic to the emperor penguins of the Antarctic, God made it all. God owns it all. God loves it all. Master Eckhart, 14th century monk, once wrote, God is not found in the soul by adding anything, but by subtracting. Eckhart was tried for uh, heresy. He was charged, charged for his radical thinking, among which was he declared that God was present in each soul, which in the 14th century was considered a heresy. But Eckhart said, God is not found by adding anything to the soul. God is not found by adding even the beauty of music or the greatness of creation or, or theological materials. You just can't add to God. But God we feel God in our soul by subtracting and making more room for God. Subtracting that which would inhibit us from having God within us. Subtracting that which, which weighs on our minds so much, causes us to despair. Or that, subtracting that which makes us think or feel we are better than somebody else, or we are more deserving of God's grace or love than somebody else. Master Eckhart is, is saying, if you want to feel, if you want more of God in your soul, then get rid of this other stuff. Subtract, and God will be there, because God is God. Fiddler's Fiddle. Kind of a strange title for a sermon, and it was meant to be. It comes from a story told by uh, Robert Fulgham in his book, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. For many years, he spent a week in a small town of Weiser, Idaho, population of about 4,000 people. Their only claim to fame is that once a year, it becomes the home of the National Old Time Fiddlers Contest. People attend from without the United States and, and around the world. The population of that little town, you know, expands three or four fold. They descend on this little town in Idaho to play and sing and dance and really have a very grand time. There was a time, he writes, when the fiddlers were playing country folk. The men had short hair, they wore you know, plaid flannel shirts and jeans or coveralls. The women, the wives, didn't work outside the home. And everyone went to church on Sunday. But over the years, the fiddler's convention began to change. Long-haired types with various body piercings began to show up. People with tattoos and leather jackets arrived on motorcycles. 
And some of these folks who seemed strange to that little community were really wonderful fiddle players. Robert Fulgham asked one of the old timers what he thought about this new crowd that was joining them. The older man said, I don't care who they are or how they look. They could have a bone in the nose, but it makes no difference to me. It just doesn't matter. If you can fiddle, you're all right with me. It's the music we make that counts. It's the music that counts. Fiddlers fiddle. Whoever they are, wherever they come from, however they look. And Christians, no matter what the stripe, live in the vision of Christ. When the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Christians in Ephesus, he wanted his friends to capture a vision. He wanted them to see that in the middle of a fractured and divided world, there is a place in God where all could come despite their very real differences. It was Paul's vision that within the Christian community, all persons would find a place of safety and wholeness. Now, the first part of Paul's vision is a hymn to God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, and who has adopted us as God's own children. Paul knew that whatever power those beleaguered Christians possessed, it was not of their own doing. They would never be overwhelmed by the powers and principalities of this world. The focus of their hearts was directed toward God. It was only when they moved away from this vision, relying on their own resources, that they would flounder and fail. It was God who infused them with the courage to live. The vertical dimension of our lives is our relationship with God. Paul reflects those sentiments of David in Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. The Lord God sits enthroned on the cherubim. The Lord is great in Zion. God is exalted over all the peoples. Holy, holy, holy is our God. Both David and Paul wanted the worshipers they addressed to center their vision of God. God is God of all who is, is the king of glory, the Lord of hosts, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. That center lifted their eyes. And they found strength. Beyond the contradictions, the harshness of their days, the impossibilities of their lives. They found strength to go on. You know, we look around at our world, national and international is issues of war, disease, death, racism, bigotry, stupidity. Or we look at our own community and we wonder if it is becoming the violence, abuse, and drug capital of Western Massachusetts. Or maybe the issues are much more personal. We feel despair. We feel depressed. We are caught up in, 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 in grief and in fear for our own lives. To the Hebrew worshipers and to the Ephesians, David and Paul said, yes, these are very real issues. I'm not trying to deny any of them. They won't go away by themselves. In fact, if left on their own, they will only get worse. If there's going to be resolution if you want encouragement to live, then the place to begin is in praise to God for who God is. Before the world began, God is. Long after the world comes to an end, God will be. And it is God who calls you God's own. Good days or bad, happy or sad, run to God, run to the Lord who gives you strength and courage. The vision Paul wants the Ephesians and us to see moves then from the vertical, our, our uh, very little knowledge of God, 
that are from the vertical in God to the horizontal in our everyday lives. In Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Here, Paul keeps faith with the words of Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God really does love the world. Heaven touches earth. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. His vision says that in Christ we have been delivered and we have found forgiveness. and Therefore, we can live. A friend of mine sent me a story about a priest in the Philippines. The priest was very much loved and was known to be a person of God by the works, by the way that he, he lived and worked within his community. But the priest carried a very heavy burden about which no one else knew. He confessed it, he prayed about it, but still he carried it. He did not believe that he was a worthy representative of God or the church. Now there was a woman in his parish who claimed to have visions of Christ. And in, in those visions, she said that they walked together and they talked together. The priest, wanting to test this woman and her visions, said to her, the next time you have such a vision, Ask Christ what sin I committed in seminary. She said she would. And the next time they met, the priest asked if she had had a vision. And she said yes, she had. The priest asked if she had, had asked Christ what sin he had committed in seminary. She said she did. And the priest said, well, then what did he say? And the woman said, he said he forgot. And that's the way it is with you and me. God forgets our sins as he forgives and welcomes us into God's kingdom. Now, I don't know the facts of that story, but I certainly know the truth of it. I believe the truth is, in Christ, we are redeemed. Any one of us may carry a heavy load from the past, something that no one else knows about. It could be a sin, we remember, or it could be a burden of, of, of grief or of sorrow. But it's a heavy, heavy burden. It says Paul, you don't have to. God invites us to give that burden to God, whatever it is that burdens us. We've already been forgiven. We are redeemed. It's taken away. And there's more. And your redemption is God's plan made known. In God's own time, God will gather up all things in heaven and on earth. God will redeem creation. I have no idea how that's going to happen. And I don't need to know. It's God's doing. It is God who is the King of glory, the Lord of hosts. Paul has a third part to his vision. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance. That inheritance is to live forever in the glory of God. We call it heaven, eternal life, the next life, being at peace. We use all kinds of words for it because we are limited to language. It's the best we can do. We serve an incredible God who has great plans and dreams for us, for today, for tomorrow, for every tomorrow, on into eternity. God's dreams are far more than we can put into words. We are talking about a God who could take a community of, of slaves and create of them a great nation. We're talking about a God who can take the hated and the despised, fill them with the Holy Spirit, and turn the world upside down. This is a God who watched, watched in horror as evil killed the sun, and then on the third day reached out and lifted him up to show us to show the world, to show eternity. That life that God 
has no power over death. That God is life. This is a God who confuses the wise and pushes the strong out of the way, who lifts the weak and empowers the humble. This is the God who soothes the brokenhearted and thunders for justice and righteousness through the land. With what words shall we describe such a God except in words of praise? Keep this vision in front of you, says Paul. Claim it for your own. Live it for the sake of others, for others to see. With such a vision, our hearts are filled not with despair, but with grace and wonder, with faith and power. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised.